Okay, so in our quest to decipher the structure of an atom, we have known so far that electron is a fundamental particle. That means it is constituted by all the atoms of all the elements. And secondly, we also know the mass of an electron, which is approximately 2000 times less than the mass of a hydrogen atom. That means the mass of electron is much less compared to the mass of an atom. This is a crucial information that one has in identifying the structure of an atom. Now J.J. Thomson, after performing his cathode ray tube experiment, started to give certain proposed structure of an atom. But the one which was accepted by many at that time was given in 1904. First, I'll very quickly tell you what the proposed structure was and then we'll try to analyze it. See, in, in his cathode ray tube experiment, he knew that certain particles comes out of the atom and that particle was negatively charged and the rest by natural will be positively charged because the atom as a whole is neutral. So the idea was that the particle which is coming out must have inherent negative charge and the rest of the atom must have inherent positive charge to balance the negative charge. So he thought of the atom to be constituted of two distinct type of matter. One is positively charged and the other is negatively charged. So he assumed that the positively charged matter is uniformly distributed in the form of a sphere. I've drawn it like a circle, but you have to visualize it as a sphere. So it's uniformly distributed in the form of the sphere. And the electrons are embedded inside the sphere, symmetrical with respect to center. So that was his idea of an atom. He thought the atom to be constituted of positive part, which is uniformly distributed in the form of a sphere, and electrons embedded inside it, symmetrical with respect to the center. So this would explain why the certain particles comes out in the, in the cathode ray tube experiment. Suppose this is the atom, and when this atom is energized, then certain electrons, which he used to call corpuscles, certain corpuscles can come out of the system, and that can be observed as is observed in cathode ray tube experiment. So that portion will be satisfactorily explained. So he thought this to be the structure of an atom. Now this model has grave defects. Actually the atom doesn't exist like this. Now the whole theory went in a wrong direction. But still, let's understand how, how can he propose this to be the structure of an atom? What was the basis for it? The basis was that he relied very heavily on the argument of symmetry. You see, argument is, of symmetry is a very common argument that one makes when one studies electrostats. If you move on to class 12 and when you start to study electrostats, you will very often see that people make this argument, argument of symmetry. See, to understand argument of symmetry, suppose there's a floor, it's a perfect flat floor and the slope is zero in any direction. So it's perfectly flat and certain, suppose water is dropping out, dropping down on that floor. So if I ask you in which direction the water will flow down, in which direction? You will say that the water will uniformly flow down in all the directions because it will not have preference in any direction because there is no preferential slope in any direction. If the slope is the same all around, suppose this is symmetrical. This point is symmetrical with respect to all direction. Then the water will not flow in particular direction. It will flow out in all direction. Similarly, if there is a ball and suppose it's hanging momentarily in the air, if there is gravity down, it will move down. If there is a force in particular direction, system will go down in that direction. But suppose there is no force at all in any direction, then in which direction will it go? It will not have a preference in any particular direction, right? Because there is no presence of force in particular direction. So since the environment is symmetric, the system will also be symmetric. Here, since the environment is symmetric, then the water will also flow symmetrically. This is the argument of symmetry. Okay, so since inside the atom, suppose the electrical environment is symmetrical. If the electrical environment is symmetrical, then by nat naturally, you would think that the distribution of the positive portion should also be symmetric. Why at all it will be in particular direction? Suppose one thinks that the positive part will be distributed like this rather than, rather than a sphere. Then this shows that there are less distribution of positive matter towards the node and there are more distribution of positive matter here. 
then one may argue what is that force that brings this positive portion of the matter more towards the end and less towards the center. To distort it like this, there should be a certain force which is pulling it outward. Now, there is no force inside the atom which is acting on the atom in such a directional manner. It's symmetrical all around. So it will be natural to assume that the positive portion it is, is distributed symmetrically. When we argue like that, it is very natural to think like that. So this was the basis for Thomson to assume that the positive portion will be distributed symmetrically and for the system to be stable, the corpuscles which we now call electron should be symmetric with respect to the center. The reason why it has to be symmetric with respect to the center, for example, suppose a corpuscle is at the edge. Then that means if you see the total positive mass on the left is much higher than the mass on the right. So the force acting towards the right will be much lower than towards the left. So there will be net force on this corpuscle. So it can't remain at this point like this. So automatically it will come at the center. When it comes at the center, then the mass is balanced from both the sides. So it will stay at the center. That's why the corpuscle has to be symmetrically placed with respect to the center. And he assumed that the positive portion is symmetrically distributed in the form of a sphere. So that was the model. Okay. So he explained the stability and he explained the reason why electrons are knocked out and that is observed in cathode ray tube experiment. So pretty much sounds good. And uh, people accepted this model because he also explained many other things. For example, it was known in 1869 if you have studied periodic table in your class 10, you would know that Mendeleev started to classify elements and he started that in 1869 and he gave, formed a periodic table and it was observed that elements actually show periodicity in their chemical properties. For example, if you have lithium, atomic number 3 and if you have sodium, atomic number 11, they have similar chemical properties. Now, if you're making a model of an atom you must account for this how does this happen why does the property of lithium and sodium are similar if your model is unable to account for it then your model is useless and actually Thomson surprisingly gave a proper explanation for this and see how did he explain this you see if you draw the structure of the atom of lithium then this the sphere will form the positive part and there are three electrons in lithium so the distribution would be like this. If you draw for the sodium, now he drew the arrangement on the copper cell for sodium like this. There are eight in the outer ring and there are three in the inner ring. Eight plus three, that's 11. Now if you draw the structure like this and he argued that there will be various ring of the copper cells and if the inner ring is similar then the chemical property will be same now there was not much of explanation for this but it sounds a little convincing that if you see these two structures then you find a similarity of three ring inner ring and the three ring in this case as well so one can be tempted to think there might be some reason due to which the chemical property will be the same because there is some similarity in the structure. Similarly, if you draw the structure of beryllium, he drew it like this for beryllium. And if you draw the structure for magnesium, again the chemical property of beryllium and magnesium will be the same. Again he drew it like this. You have an octagon as the outer ring, 8, and again a full ring inside, that's 12. So the chemical property of beryllium and magnesium, he argued, will be the same because the inner ring of both the atom is the same. So he somehow tried to explain the periodicity in chemical properties of elements. So this gave a little weight to the model. Okay. Similarly, there is one more thing that was known already. That is called spectral lines. Now spectral lines will be discussed as we move ahead in the chapter but I'll give you a little bit of idea. Suppose you have a 
box and there are certain gases and then you put this system and you incident certain light on the system. The light will have various frequencies. Now it is observed that when the light passes through the system, certain frequencies are absorbed. That means if you have, if you allow the light to pass through and you have a detector that will detect what frequencies of light is falling on the detector, then detector will miss certain frequency which is initially incident on the system. That means the radiation corresponding to those frequencies are absorbed and they no more passes through. So they are lost in the system. And so whatever radiation is detected by the de detector that becomes the spectral line for this particular system. Okay, and this is the fingerprint of each system. Suppose you have a neon, then the detector will detect certain frequencies. That frequencies, then that set of frequency will not match with any other gas. If you put oxygen, that, that set of frequency which is detected by the detector will be different than nitrogen, will be different than carbon monoxide, will be different than oxygen. Everything will change. So that becomes the identification for the gas. So this was known, this was known much before the discovery of electron, this was known. Now, in, you have to account also for this because you have to account for everything which is already known. If you can't, then the model is not good enough. Now, he tried to also explain this. Now, the explanation was not very convincing, but somehow he did try. Now, he tried to explain this by saying that actually, there are many, many, there are thousands of electrons inside an atom. So, when you have huge number of corpuscles or electrons inside this model, inside the positive sphere, then there are chance that certain light will be absorbed and certain and rest will be allowed to pass through. How will it be absorbed? It will be absorbed by the electrons and it will start to somehow absorb that energy and utilize that energy. How? Either by colliding with other electrons or by moving in a circle, somehow that energy will be lost inside the system because there are too many electrons inside it. Although the explanation was not very convincing, but somehow he did attempt it. So he did attempt to explain the periodicity of the element and he did attempt to explain the spectral lines as well. So his model gained certain weight for five years until 1909 when gold foil experiment was done and it was found out that actually the structure is much different than what he proposed. Okay, so presently this is a discarded system. You don't study the chemistry of this kind of system because it is far from reality but still but still it was a good start by jj thompson and he actually using the information he could this was the best that he could have come up with because the gold foil experiment that was done afterwards and the information that was gathered from there was not available to thompson when he proposed this model so with these two available informations he attempted to explain the structure and this is what he came up with but somehow it was gone in a wrong direction. Now before closing this, I will also tell you why at all J. Thompson was so convinced that this should be the structure of an atom. Now this is not important from the exam point of view, but I must tell you to give you a little more insight. See, there was a man called Alfred Marshall Mayer. He performed certain experiment much before J.J. Thompson started to perform his own experiment. Now, the experiment performed by Alfred Marshall was like this. He took a container and he filled that with water. Now, he had magnetic needles and he attached those needles from a cock and he immersed that needle in the water. So, there were many needles immersed into the water like this and he generated magnetic field and he passed that magnetic field through the system. Now the system comes under uniform magnetic field and he observed the pattern in which the needles attached with the cock arrange themselves inside the system and he observed when there is only one needle then the needle comes at the center. When there is two needle, the needle is symmetrical with respect to the center. When there are three needle, the needle forms an equilateral triangle. Similarly, when there are four, you have a square. Similarly, when you have five, you have a pentagon. When you have six, you have a hexagon. When you have seven, 
then you have a hexagon and you have one at the center. Similarly, when you have an eight, then you have a hexagon and two at the center. Similarly, using many, many needles, he identified the pattern that once one get for this particular system. And he had those patterns. And J.D. Thompson actually used the pattern given by Alfred Marshall. Now, when he had six corpuscles, he used the pattern which these needles form, that is hexagon. So he said that it will be a hexagon. The reason why, because he assumed the positive part to be uniformly distributed, just like magnetic field here is uniformly distributed. Now, these needles are under the influence of uniform magnetic field. Now, these corpuscles or electrons are under the influence of uniform electric field because electric charge will produce electric fields. So he brought an analogy in his system with the system of Alfred Marshall. Now, he would have been right if his argument of symmetry would have hold true here. You see, there is no problem in arguing that because the needles are arranged like this, similarly the corpuscles would be arranged like this. There is no problem because the system is quite similar. Now, he didn't do a mistake in comparing his system with the system of Alfred Marshall. There was no mistake because this system has uniform magnetic field. This system has uniform electric field. No problem. But the problem was that he assumed the positive charge to be uniformly distributed in space in the form of a sphere. That was the problem. Now, that was a wrong assumption. The positive charge is not uniformly distributed in a sphere. So that was a mistake done by him. And you see, it was difficult for him to know the right distribution of positive charge so that that's why the whole the whole model went in a wrong direction but nevertheless it was the first model and it was the harbinger for the models that will be given subsequently by his own student rutherford that will study subsequently